Welcome to the campus at Colorado State University, where today we'll be talking about proper use of animal health products. My name is Ryan Rupert, and I'm the director of the National Beef Quality Assurance Program, funded by your checkoff dollars. Before we get started today, let's review the fundamentals to the Beef Quality Assurance Program. First, an effective, ongoing involvement of your veterinarian is critical to program success. A sound record keeping system provides the ability to benchmark and demonstrate progress. Feedstuff management is important to both good nutrition and healthy cattle. Use biologics and pharmaceuticals correctly. Implement effective handling to minimize stress and enhance performance of both cattle and people. Utilize appropriate transportation practices. And finally, provide continuous training and count on your state BQA coordinator to provide you up-to-date information. My name's Tom Field. I'm executive director for producer education at NCBA. Granddad was right when he said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. A good herd health management program is founded on disease prevention, and minimizing or eliminating the stressful factors in our operations that can affect the immunity of our cattle. BQA plays a central role in a good herd health program, but it's important to found a herd health program on several key fundamentals. The first of these is design a herd health program with the assistance and input of your veterinarian. Use of appropriate sanitation measures, especially in calving barns, processing areas and other environments where pathogens may be concentrated is important to good prevention. Implement a strong nutrition program. As the old adage goes, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Maintain and use good records. Effectively train your personnel and provide retraining opportunities. And finally, utilize a beef quality assurance approach in your herd with an emphasis on the proper use of animal health care products. BQA is a systematic and intentional approach to providing appropriate care for the right management of the cattle under our stewardship. It's also evidence of our commitment to providing safe and wholesome products to consumers. And certainly BQA is the right thing to do. But it's also a profitable business strategy. John Patterson and Clint Peck of Montana State University shared with me recently the results of a study done by a banker in Montana that evaluated the impact of a BQA program on a 300 head cow-calf operation in that state. Here's what they found. Just by implementing a quiet, humane handling system added five pounds to the gain of the calves in that operation. Handling cattle quietly provided five extra pounds of gain. In a $1.10 market, that equates to $5.50 per calf and a total return to the ranch of $1,650. By correctly storing, handling, and administering vaccines, each calf weighs an extra five pounds at sale time, adding another $5.50 per calf and a total return of $1,650. With correct product administration and stockmanship, death loss is reduced, and two extra 600-pound calves are weaned, returning $1,320 to the outfit. By keeping working facilities in good order, using proper transportation technique, and implementing good handling, a ranch avoids discounts on market cows and bulls. Assuming that these good practices prevent a couple of head from being lame and thus incurring a 15 cent discount, the ranch realizes another $360. Implementation of effective handling techniques in a working facility lowers repair costs. So let's assume a 5% decline in costs on a $2,500 facility 
by not overloading the pens and by quiet handling. This yields another $125 to the bottom line. Finally, because good stockmanship and BQA leads to a safer working environment, we can also better avoid injury to people. With a 5% decrease in workman's compensation and medical costs of $5,000, the ranch yields another $250 in savings. Add it all up, $5,335 to the bottom line in increased revenues or cost savings. That's about $18 a calf. Makes a really good case for BQA, don't you think? Today we're going to focus on the proper handling and administration of animal health care products and routine processing and treatment of cattle. Joining me is Dr. Jason Ahola, faculty member at Colorado State University who's in charge of the beef program at the Research Center here. Jason, as we start our day to begin processing cattle, what are some of the real fundamentals that we need to have in mind before we even walk into the processing barn? Yeah, I think it's really important to consider a few key things. One of those is safety, and that's both for your employees and also for your cattle. And uh, that's being sure that your equipment runs and works properly, and also that footing is safe for both people and cattle. I think it's also important to consider an environment that's very calm and low stress, again, for both people and cattle to avoid injuries and, and damaging any equipment or people. And then also, uh, I think you need to only put people in uh, doing a, a procedure that they're trained in and comfortable doing, and then offering them retraining uh, as, as time goes on. And it's also important to consider uh, record keeping and then also uh, being close, uh, being uh, good about following label directions and really following that all the way through on uh, every aspect of the label. I think if you do all of those things, your goal should be to have zero bruises, zero residues, zero injection site lesions, and basically zero uh, defects to your cattle uh, as a result of working them. Great, so it sounds like you started with the, with the right attitude. And you mentioned training. A lot of us on our ranches are in key processing times, branding or weaning. Uh, we have to rely on day help, and sometimes that day help is the kids from the neighboring ranch or our kids' friends from high school or even the local attorney from town. What do we do with that day help in terms of training? That's a good question because more and more ranchers are having to rely on day help. They don't necessarily have enough employees every day to work large groups of cattle in a, in a short period of time. So we do have to realize that that's a, a, a required source of help on most ranches. At the same time, I think it's important to recognize what the skill level is uh, among your day help and what they're comfortable doing or not doing and not putting them in a position where they might do something uh, that would endanger them or any of the cattle that you're working. Um, at the same time, I think it's an opportunity to train some of these people and expect more of them, especially if there's someone that's going to come back. And I think it's important to not be afraid to uh, remove a person from doing a certain duty if they're not trained in it or to also uh, put someone in place that you have confidence in that, that can accomplish that. So it sounds like before we start our work day, we, we want to have a plan or an attitude, actually. We want to be focused on safety, a calm working environment. We want to make sure we've got our people trained and give them opportunities for retraining. We want to follow the label. We want to absolutely maintain our record system. And we want to be committed to a zero defect policy. Sounds like a great way to start the day. Why don't we go get to work? Each animal health care product will come with a label insert which contains a variety of useful information including product name, class of livestock for which the product is intended, appropriate dosage, timing of administration, route of administration, site of administration, withdrawal time, expiration date, lot and serial number, and storage and disposal instructions. I want to draw your attention to several of these instructions before we discuss dose, timing, route, and site of administration. Record the specific information such as animal ID or uh, group ID. Record information like the drug's name, the lot 
and the serial number of that particular drug, the expiration date of the product, the dosage, and in the comments or in some area, the route and the site of administration, and also record all withdrawal times of the product. Also, make sure that you file the label insert with the, the particular uh, record information. Jason, there are several different uh, routes of administration for these different animal health care products. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, there's, there's probably five main or uh, most common methods of getting uh, drugs into an animal system. Uh, the first would probably be orally, which is in the mouth. The second would be topically or on the skin or on the hide. Uh, the third, intravenously, which is getting something into the vein with a needle or a catheter. Uh, and then the fourth and fifth are probably the more common ones of giving vaccines and that sort of thing. And that's either uh, subcutaneously, which is underneath the skin, or intramuscularly, which is into the muscle. And really the intramuscular option is uh, the one that we desire the least, but some products do require that you use intramuscular administration. Before we give these products, restraint is really important to make sure that, that the animal and, and the people are safe. Can you explain to us uh, these different forms of restraint? Yeah, there are, really are a lot of forms of restraint. Uh, in small cattle, calves particularly, there's a, a lot of ways we can do it without any kind of equipment, uh, just simply flanking and laying down a calf uh, either in a pen or potentially roping and laying down a calf is an option. But once a calf gets very large, we typically use a chute or maybe a calf table. In this case, we use a hydraulic chute. And it's very important that that piece of equipment uh, is maintained properly, operates properly, and really that the person who runs it knows what they're doing. Before giving any injections to an animal, it's important that we review a few important things about syringes and needles and care of those pieces of equipment. A one inch 18 gauge needle is a needle that we would use for a subcutaneous injection while a longer needle, that's for instance one and a half inches, is one that we would use for an intramuscular inside the muscle injection. A few key things to make sure is that you're using a clean needle and that you're changing that needle about every 10 head. But for instance, if an, a needle gets damaged, for instance, this is as a burr at the end of the needle, it immediately needs to be discarded and changed. Another thing that happens is sometimes needles get bent and we in no circumstance should straighten those and use them again. Once a needle is bent, it's been damaged and it should be discarded. If for any reason a needle does break off in an animal's hide, immediately contact your veterinarian and work through a solution to either remove that uh, piece of needle or dispose of that animal so it does not enter the food chain. And also it's important to not use hubs that are plastic. You need to use a needle hub that is aluminum Otherwise, you can risk damaging or breaking off the end of a needle. And it's also important after you do use a needle that it's disposed of properly, not directly into the garbage, but into a sharps container that can be disposed of later. A couple of things we often do is use a syringe uh, such as this, which is a disposable syringe. A few things that are important is to label that syringe with what product we're using. So for instance, modified live vaccine, we would identify that and we would identify this syringe with a Bacterin. And in both cases, at the end of the day, or possibly even earlier, we dispose of those syringes and replace those with new ones. These are not intended to be washed and used again. When we administer any kind of pharmaceutical product, we need to make sure that we do it properly to get the most uh, benefit out of the product that we're using. In this case, I'm gonna use a modified live vaccine that's gonna be given subcutaneously. So I'm going to choose the shorter needle, which is our subcutaneous needle, and uh, we'll use a, a product that we have combined here, Modified Live, and I'm going to draw up into my syringe, and then before I remove that, remove some of the air that's in the syringe and then it's important to recap that needle before you actually begin working just so that you don't have any dangers of anybody getting injected.
So we're in the process of administering uh, parasiticide to this steer. He's been weighed and I've adjusted the amount that he's going to receive based on his weight and the allocation on the label. And then we want to administer this topically or through the animal's hide. So it's very important when we administer a drug orally that we catch the animal's head to prevent injury to the animal or to the handler. And then we would use a bolus gun. Find a spot here that we can get this end of the gun in behind the animal's front teeth and very gently get that started down in there. Some of the saliva helps to aid its moving through. Get past over the top of the tongue, so down to a spot where the animal's not uh, longer able to fight against you, where it's sort of in a calm place, and then administer the bolus and remove the gun. Just make sure that your bolus is empty to administer an oral product. I'm going to demonstrate the subcutaneous injection site procedure, which is the preferred route of administration of giving an injection to an animal. And this is given in the injection site triangle, which we have identified here with pink chalk. And the boundaries of this uh, triangle are the scapula, or the shoulder, the nuchal ligament up in the neck, and then the spine down below. And what we typically do is do either a one-handed uh, technique where we're unable to do a tenting method, where we put the injection in at an angle, pull back to make sure we're no longer in the muscle, and administer that injection. So we also have the two-handed uh, tent technique for giving a subcutaneous injection, which involves grabbing a pinch of skin and then a perpendicular to that inserting the needle and administering the injection. Under BQA protocol, we never give an injection here. All approved injections in BQA are given in this area of the animal. This is done for product quality purposes. Injections will make the product tough at the end of the day. By giving these products in the neck, we assure our consumer has a much better eating experience than if we were to give them in the more valuable cuts in the back part of the animal. When giving an intermuscular injection, it is important that we do it the proper way. If we have to give more than 10 cc's of a product, that product must be given in two locations that are more than uh, four inches apart, which is pretty much the width of your hand. So. What we would do is lay, this on, lay our hand on here and we would give one injection in the front and one injection in the back. <clears throat> in this case, we're only going to give one injection and the proper way to give this would be to go right in here in this area of the injection site triangle. When mixing vaccines, it is very important that, that we thoroughly mix a product, especially with modified lives because these products tend to settle. So we can draw product out of uh, this bottle into the syringe that one dose may have more of the, the effective portion of the vaccine and another will have less. So essentially some cattle will be getting more than their appropriate dose and others will be getting a lot less. And over time, the vaccine will tend to settle. Uh, we should never mix more than 30 minutes worth of vaccines at a time. Uh, because modified lives lose their effectiveness as soon as we mix them. And as they sit, they tend to settle. So we want to continually mix the product so that we're giving the appropriate vaccine to every animal. It's absolutely critical that we maintain animal health care products at the appropriate temperature. We need to be aware of that temperature during transport, during storage, and then while we've got that product shoot side or at the processing area. Modified live vaccines in particular are particularly temperature sensitive. And so we want to keep those products out of direct sunlight. We want to keep them at a appropriate temperature, uh, typically using a cooler uh, contained with ice or ice packs to maintain that product at its appropriate temperature. 
It's very critical to understand that each product has with it label instructions as to the storage. For example, here's an antimicrobial. This is not to be stored at refrigerated temperature, it's not to be frozen, and it's not to be stored at extreme, extremely high temperatures. So room temperature is appropriate for this product, thus it would not be contained within the cooler with those products that need to be chilled. On the other hand, products such as a modified live vaccine will in fact need to be contained in a temperature controlled environment under either a cold pack or ice. It's important to recognize as well that modified live vaccines need to be mixed at an appropriate rate to match the rate at which your crew is working. If you mi mix too much vaccine early in the day, expecting it to last throughout the day, what's going to happen is the efficacy or the efficiency of that vaccine is going to diminish as the day progresses. Another important thing to keep in mind is when we finish the day and we've got a little bit of product left over, it is not appropriate to re-refrigerate and use the next day or a week later or two months later. In fact, if it's been opened, we've had it at shoot side, it's a refrigerated product and a modified live vaccine, it needs to be discarded that day and start fresh the next time you process cattle. In summary, let's remember these key elements. We want to keep these products at the appropriate temperature in accordance with the label on the product. Secondly, avoid direct exposure to sunlight, high temperatures, or freezing temperatures for most products. Make sure that we have a functional working cooler with appropriate levels of ice or ice packs to maintain temperature of that vaccine, not only at the bottom of the bottle, but all the way to the top. We want to absolutely make sure that we're not over mixing, having too much product available early in the day, and then have that product denatured by the time we get to the end of the day. Product that's not finished on the day of processing should be discarded, particularly modified live vaccines and other vaccines. And finally, make sure that you train your crew to follow these temperature guidelines. Finally, there are a few big mistakes that should absolutely be avoided. First of all, do not expose these products directly to sunlight. The vaccines particularly can be rendered ineffective in a very short period of time. Even if you're making a quick drive from one processing area to the other, do not take your vaccine, throw it up on the dashboard of the truck for that quick trip because that too will create temperature variation in the product that may in fact render it useless. Make sure you train your people so they understand the proper handling, the proper loading, proper administration of vaccines and animal health care products. And finally, remember during storage, a functioning refrigerator that has accurate temperature control is very critical. Several university studies have evaluated on-farm refrigeration and found wide discrepancies in the actual temperatures at which products are maintained. So it's critical that you absolutely monitor the temperature of the storage room and of the refrigeration unit during storage time. Thank you for joining us to learn more about the proper administration of animal health care products. We look forward to sharing more tips in our following sessions. To learn more about BQA, go to bqa.org.